I'm Natalie Benamou. I'm the founder of her C-suite, and I'm also the founder of Her Health X. And Her Health X is a nonprofit focused on improving health outcomes for women. And I'm delighted to be talking about this topic today because it's all about how we can improve our health outcomes by being aware of certain uh, things that we might not be thinking about and things like extravasation, step therapy, patient advocacy. We're going to be talking about some details that will help you on your journey. And some of the things that we're going to be talking about today extend past cancer care. And it also is just care in general. So I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. And with our panel today, I cannot wait to get started with our amazing speakers today. I have We have Carrie Lado, Molly McDonald, and Pam Cole, who are all going to be sharing different perspectives for you to learn about these important topics. So please do continue popping in the chat about your about uh, your experiences and what brings you today. And I am going to, um, I'm going to spotlight you. Uh, let's do a spotlight on you here really quick. Um, sorry, I got to get to you. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So I am really excited to, for our first conversation. And I didn't even know that this was a thing before I talked to you. And then you told me and I talked to Pam and I was like, wait a second, I did not know. Mm -hmm. So Carrie, I'm thrilled to introduce you here and I'd love for you to share a little bit about your background and then we're gonna dive in about extravasation and all the things. But first talk a little bit about yourself and, and our bringing us together today. Yeah, happy to. Hi everyone, I am Carrie Lotto. I live in Wisconsin. Um, I am with RX for Good and represent the Patients for Safer Nuclear Medicine Coalition. Uh, health is a real important, um, I hold it close to my heart because I've been in this, in this area for over 20 years. And so much like Natalie, when I heard about this issue three years ago, I couldn't believe it. And I have been on a mission ever since. So let's, you know, let's jump in, Natalie, and talk about extravasations. Yeah, I don't even think, I, well, let me just ask the audience. I'm going to ask the audience, does anyone, does everyone know what this is? Because I did not know. So raise your, pop in the chat. I know some of you are off camera, but share in the chat if you've heard of what extravasation is, because I did not know. All right. We have some people that didn't know. So I am so thrilled that we're going to be able to learn about it. So let's talk about what is it and what do we start there? <laughs> right. Let's start at the beginning. Great yeah. question. So uh, nuclear medicine scans are common for cancer, but as well as heart problems and brain diseases. So it's typically known as a PET CT, a SPECT, or a bone scan. Those might be terms that people are familiar with. But in simple terms, these scans use radiation uh, attached to a drug. So this radioactive drug is injected into your vein, and it really travels to all parts of your body. And some of the radiation energy leaves your body and hits these crystals in the scanners to make an image of your insides. And nuclear medicine scans are really an essential part of the care journey and are safe when they're done correctly. So the problem is if the technologist accidentally puts a hole in the back of your vein <clears throat> when they insert the IV or they blow the vein during the injection, that is what's called an extravasation. So if that's the case, all the radiation that is supposed to be circulating in your bloodstream to take this image, it's not all in your bloodstream because some of it has, has missed the vein and it's stuck in your tissue and it's exposing your tissue to this nuclear medicine. So your tissue is getting really high radiation levels. So this is what an extravasation is when you're having a nuclear medicine scan. So shockingly, uh, there is no monitoring of these injections to ensure that they're done properly. Um, 
And I guarantee you, your hospital is not monitoring and your technologist is not using best practices when you are getting your scan. Because best practice is to use a vein finder or an ultrasound to find the best vein. And using vein finding tools is especially important for our populations with darker skin tones because it's much more difficult to find a vein by eyesight alone. But this isn't happening. Evidence has shown us that these practices aren't happening. And because hospitals are not monitoring this injection when you go in for a scan, they don't have to report when an extravasation happens. So they don't have to tell you, they don't have to tell your care team, your oncologist. In fact, patients aren't even alerted with like a one pager to the risk of an extravasation. So ironically, if that same drug is accidentally spilled onto your skin, hospitals must report it. There's a whole mechanism of, you know, how to clean it up, how to report it. But if it's injected inside your body and gets into your tissue and there's a mistake, it doesn't have to be reported. So, you know, it's just common sense. Uh, you know, as, as, a, as a coalition, we just can't believe that this is happening. And there are approximately 30 million diagnostic radioactive drug injections a year. And we estimate that about a thousand large extravasations happen every single day. And they're going unreported and they're going, you know, uh, there's patient harm. And if hospitals would just monitor the injection, just monitor it, it could reduce the number of large extravasations from 1,000 per day to less than 3,000 per year. And that's why we started the Patients for Safer Nuclear Medicine Coalition. We are a group of 30 plus nonprofit patient focused organizations dedicated to ensuring safer nuclear medicine procedures. Our members are completely volunteer members like Pam and Molly and Natalie, who are all with us today. Um, they do not receive any financial compensation for their advocacy efforts. It's another hat that they've put on because it's the right thing to do. And we're all working together to protect people from these accidental radiation exposures known as extravasations. And folks can join our coalition. Everyone is welcome to join and our website is safernuclearmedicine.org. Yeah, and I'll pop that into the chat. We'll have all the links and I'll also send it to everyone afterwards because this is so important. When I heard of this, I had just, I believe the timing was when I first talked with Molly about it and she shared it, shared it with me. And then when we talked, I had just had a nuclear test and by, I was lucky. I did not have um, any extravasation, but I went back to my cardiologist and I said, Hey, I didn't know about this. What, what do you know about it? And she said, well, don't worry about it. If, if it leaks into your body, it just gets reabsorbed. So even the medical profession, even our doctors, and I love, I like her. It's nothing like that, but right. I was so astounded with, but it doesn't get it. That's not what happens. And why right. is it so serious? And I know we're going to hear firsthand from Pam in a little bit, but I'd like for you to talk about the, the why and what hap what is it that happens? So we talked about that this can happen. But what are some of the things that happen to our body when that nuclear medicine, because, you know, I, you said when it, when we touch it, it's, <laughs> you don't want to touch it. So obviously you don't want it floating around. Right. What are some of the things that happen. Uh, great question. And yeah, this is nuclear medicine people, right? Like this is nuclear, <laughs> nuclear medicine. So, um, and again, these scans are, are very safe and we do count on them, especially if you're living with cancer, you count on them for your care and your treatment. Um, these scans are used to stage cancer. They're, de they're used to you know, determine a treatment plan. And Pam will talk more about that because she uses scans a lot in her treatment plans. So a large extravasation can compromise this image that's being used for your treatment plan. So it can lead to 
incorrect staging. It can lead to a wrong diagnosis. It can lead to an inaccurate treatment plan. And your oncologist probably doesn't even know you've been extravasated. So they're making decisions based on this image that is inaccurate because all of the medicine didn't get through your bloodstream, right? So the image is an inaccurate because the medicine isn't flowing through your bloodstream the way it should be. So, you know, since that radiation is just sitting in your tissue, extravasations can cause tissue and skin damage down the road. Um, in the longer term, it could increase the risk of secondary cancer. The thing about extravasations, you know, people would think like, oh, I should be, if I'm extravasated, we'll see it. It'll be red and it'll swell up and it'll be obvious. But that's not the case. And Pam will tell you in her, when it happened to her, that's not the case. She just knew it felt weird and she had to really advocate for herself. So you may not know just by looking alone that that radiation is sitting inside your tissue. Um, so, you know, if you're going in for a scan, what can you do? Uh, first of all, your oncologist should really demand that your injection be monitored. Um, and if, if an extravasation does happen, that it should be reported to you and your care team so they can decide whether to repeat it or, you know, what the next steps are. Now, if you do have a scan coming up, we have a great infographic on our website. Again, that's safernuclearmedicine.org. There's an infographic called Five Simple Steps Before Your Scan. So, you know, just at high level, those steps are call your hospital before your scan to insist on an ultrasound device or a vein finder. That's really the best practice. Um, you're going to Second step is to ask the hospital to monitor the injection. Um, and if they don't monitor it, to take an image of the injection site after they, you know, insert to ensure that the radioactive drug did not enter the tissue. If you were extravasated and they take an image of the injection site, it'll show a black spot. It'll be very obvious um, that you were extravasated. And so if there is radiation in the tissue, Ask the hospital to tell you how much and make a note in your medical record. So if you have skin problems down the road, that note is in your medical record. Um, and extravasation symptoms really vary. Um, there may not be visible signs right away. So having that in your medical record is going to help you down the road. And then inform your entire care team if you were extravasated so they can make decisions on whether to repeat um, the scan or what to do. And if you don't feel comfortable asking these requests of your hospital, you know, talk to your care team, talk to your doctor and ask them to make those requests on your behalf. At this point, we have to be our own advocates until things change um, and that until we can actually um, have these injections monitored, you have to stand up for yourself. So again, go to our website. We have a great infographic on what to do when you go get a scan. And one last thing that I wanted to touch on before we go, um, and we're going to talk with Pam in a second, but there's a, there's something in Congress. There's something in Congress right now yeah. that's I'm looking over at my notes, HR 6815, the Nuclear Medicine Clarification Act. Can you talk about that and how we can talk to our Congress people about this? Because that is so important. It is so important. Um, so this is kind of is different because it's nuclear medicine. It is regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So it's called the NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So they're the body that makes decisions about extravasations. Um, and right now they are not on the patient side of this issue. Um, they are siding with the industry that they are supposed to be regulating and professional medical societies don't want patients to know about extravasations. So as a coalition, um, we found out that, you know, the NRC is being misled by their own advisors. There's a report out there from the inspector general saying, you know, they're being misled. And as a coalition, we thought it's time for Congress to, to intervene. So this Nuclear Medicine Clarification Act 6R15 was introduced by Representative Griffith of Virginia and Davis of North Carolina. And it's really straightforward, simple legislation 
which would require the Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission to treat large extravasations just like any other medical event. Um, it ensures transparency, it protects patients, and it gives hospitals a grace period so they can strengthen their procedures and reduce their extravasation rates. Um, this legislation requires hospitals to monitor nuclear medicine injections so they can identify when a large extravasation happens and take the steps to mitigate the harm to the patient. If you are extravasated and it's being monitored in real time, there are steps to mitigate the damage to your tissue. But if it's not being monitored, you're walking out of the hospital carrying all that radiation inside your tissue and not knowing it. So this legislation requires hospitals to monitor so they can learn from their mistakes and they can prevent future extravasations. It also helps patients make an informed decision about where they want to receive care. Because of transparency, hospitals will have to report their extravasation rate, and patients can determine, do I want to go to a hospital that has a 50% extravasation rate? You know, it's really transparency and care, but we need everyone's help on this legislation. We're looking for co-sponsors. We're looking for people to reach out to their Congress people. So please contact us on our website at safernuclearmedicine.org and you can get involved and help us get this legislation passed. Thank you so much. We have a couple questions and um, I, I wanna, we'll have one one question then we're gonna go to, to Pam and that is, you touched on this a little bit, but about the remedy about what to do. So, and I know Pam's going to talk about that. So um, maybe we'll go, maybe we'll cover that with Pam because you know, Pam's going to share what happened and, and the remedy. So I'm going to ship that over, I think. Yeah, Pam will be um, great to answer. Yeah. yeah. So um, we will um, get to all the questions at the end and, and thank you for posting some of your um, questions here, but I want to make sure that we have time because Pam's story is so compelling. I'm going to um, turn it over to Pam and we're going to have a conversation about her experience, both as a patient um, with breast cancer, but then also what happened as you know the story because you introduced me to me. I'm so, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, so I'm going to um, just uh, bring Pam here and I'm thrilled to introduce you, Pam, for being here today. So thank you, Carrie, for, for your insights. And we'll circle back at Q&A. Pam, thank you for being here today. I'm going to um, spotlight you so that you're you're seen by everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your story today. And I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about your background because it is really important for people to understand as it relates to your story. Um, great, so glad to see you and see everybody. Thank you for joining us on this important topic. I'm Pam Cole and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina and um, born and raised in North Carolina. So um, in 2010, I was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer. And, you know, if you're going to have breast cancer, I was, I kept being told you have the best kind and that you have estrogen positive breast cancer, which means there are a lot of um, treatments available. And stage one meant I caught it early. Um, it was less than a centimeter. And so the decision was to have a lumpectomy, radiation, and five years of endocrine therapy. Endocrine therapy being a systemic approach to get, um, since the cancer was estrogen dependent, to get rid of as most, uh, the most amount of estrogen in the body. So I did all of that, had lymph nodes removed, had no lymph node involvement, less than a centimeter. And then I had an oncotype test, which basically takes the uh, tissue and analyzes it in a variety of ways to see what your risk of recurrence is. And if your risk of recurrence is a low number, then you really don't need chemotherapy. It's kind of considered overkill because your risk is so low. If you have a middle range oncotype, it's kind of an art form and the doctors and the patient will decide, well, maybe I should go ahead and do the chemo. And if it's at a higher number, then you need, um, definitely need the chemo to help prevent recurrence. Well, my oncotype number was six, which is very low. So 
Um, I had a very low risk of recurrence. So had the lumpectomy, had the um, uh, radiation and did my endocrine therapy for five years, which was the plan. And that was at that time, the standard protocol. At the end of that protocol, my doctor said, you're cancer free. You can look cancer in your rear view mirror and you can stop your endocrine therapy. At that time, I worked for Susan G. Komen and I knew that there was a study coming out that would tell us that for many women, we needed to stay on our endocrine therapy for 10 years instead of five years. Um, and I mentioned it to my oncologist. I knew the study was coming out. He said, no, no, you're fine. Go off. Your, you can stop your endocrine therapy. You're cancer free. Um, and as a patient, that's what I wanted to hear. So I didn't ask any more questions. Even when the study came out, I felt confident that I was done. Um, in 2016, so I was on the endocrine therapy for five years. In 2016, I went in for my annual mammogram in October, um, went by myself, of course, just assuming everything was going to be okay. And they called me back several times for more pictures, which once you've had breast cancer, you sort of know what that means. And started getting very nervous and they said something is suspicious and we're gonna have a have you have an ultrasound right now which that in and of itself was another anxiety producer when they do it right then they did they kept looking at it and they had a couple radiologists look at it and they came in and said we still think that it's nothing we think it's scar tissue from your lumpectomy but just to be in abundance of caution, um, let's go ahead and do the biopsy. And we did the biopsy and it came back as uh, breast cancer, estrogen positive breast cancer again. So big shock for everybody that I had a recurrence at all. And because that breast had been radiated, I needed to have a mastectomy. So um, at that point, I asked whether we needed to look any further, but everybody was just confident it was just a recurrence. So I had the mastectomy, the pathology came back a little funky, but um, they felt confident that what needed to happen is that I just needed to go back on endocrine therapy for a while. My radiation on college, and I said, I, don't you think I need a PET scan just to make sure every, we were confident that I wasn't going to have a recurrence? No, 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 you don't need that. Everything's cool. You'll just go back on endocrine therapy. It still didn't quite sit well with me, but, um, you know, as a patient, that's what you want to hear. When the pathology came back and my oncologist called me and said, you know, we're confident it is still ER positive. We're confident we're just going to put you on the endocrine therapy. And I, again, asked for a PET scan and um, no, you're you're good. OK, then my radiation oncologist called me a couple, I guess, maybe two weeks later and said, you know, I'm 95 percent certain, you know, you do not need radiation in that lymph node area but I'm gonna take it to the tumor board just to make sure. Well, at that point I became fierce and um, which any of you who have had cancer, you know, we have to find that fierceness at some point. And I said, well, if we're going to the tumor board, don't we need all of the information? Don't we want that? And she again said, I really don't think we need to do it. You know, PET scans are oversensitive. We're going to, it might light up and then we have to poke and prod you for no reason. And I said, I am confident that I am fine. But if I'm back here in five years, don't we want a baseline? And I just kept pushing in that phone call. And she said, okay, I will see if I can get insurance to pay for it. We had the PET scan and I got the phone call early in the morning where she said, see, this is why we don't like PET scans. Two areas lit up. We don't think it's anything. But now we have to poke and prod you. And now we have to do a biopsy. And I'm like, you know, it's not making me very confident every time you say we think it's nothing at this stage. 
So we had the biopsy. I was put to sleep because of where it was. Um, and I'm in the uh, area recovery room, outpatient recovery with my husband at 6.30 at night. And I see my oncologist and my radiation oncologist walking towards our room. And it's 6.30 at night and it's both of them. And I looked at my husband and said, this is not going to be a good conversation. And they came in and said that I had stage four metastatic breast cancer and how shocked they were and that this should not have happened. I had such a low oncotype, you know, the same stuff. And I asked at that point, you know, what is my um, prognosis? And of course, they don't really want to tell you, but I said, look, I've been at Komen for 10 years. You know, the good news is I know a lot. And the bad news is I know a lot. And so I, you know, just be straight with me. And they said the average um, life expectancy was two to three years. But, you know, they they have some patients who li have lived longer than that. And we were going to start a new treatment. And when you have stage four metastatic breast cancer or stage four metastatic any kind of disease, it means you're in treatment forever. And it means that you must be monitored very carefully to see how your treatment is working. And so in 2017, I started my treatment. And since 2017, I've had scans every three months. And these scans are critically important. And I want to make sure um, that we make it very clear that PET scans, bone scans, et cetera, are safe. And it's very important to have these scans for staging and then for those of us who are stage four to monitor our disease so that we can have the appropriate um, treatment plan. And so I've had these scans and, you know, in January last year, I celebrated seven years, which is amazing. Um, but during that seven years, those scans have shown progression and it shows the progression early on. And so I've had to change treatment and I'm now on my third line of treatment and I have my next scan uh, next Tuesday. So I'm already starting with my scan anxiety, right? So it's, it's so important that these scans are accurate because my entire treatment and really my entire, my life is dependent on the accuracy and an extravasation jeopardizes the accuracy. And on one of my scans, um, when they inject, were injecting the nuclear medicine, it just didn't feel right. It burned in a way that I hadn't felt before. And it is true that those of us who are getting scanned on a regular basis, um, our veins start to get shot, you know? And so finding an accurate and adequate vein can be a challenge. And even when I would ask for an ultrasound early on before my extravasation, these technologists ha have big egos. And they do not want to use the scan, the uh, ultrasound. They say, oh, let me try. I can do it. And again, you're in a gown. You're the patient. You have no power or you feel like you have no power. So this was a scan that did not have, they did not use ultrasound. I said, I don't, something's not right. And they said, oh, everything's fine. I can tell. Um, you know, we're getting blood return and everything's good. And they kept pushing. And I just kept saying this, something's not right. And I want you to put my arm under um, an x-ray machine because in many of our scans, our arms are held up and they are not in the scan. So they don't necessarily show that there's been an extravasation because they're not in the scan. I said, I, before we do the scan, I want to see where we are. And sure enough, there was a huge blob of nuclear medicine uh, right in my elbow area. And it showed up clear as day. They did nothing to mitigate. They did not use warm compresses. They did not 
do any kind of massage. They didn't tell me anything about what to do. They didn't what to look for in the future. They didn't tell me what I should say to my oncologist. And we went ahead with the scan. And so that afternoon when I met with my oncologist, you know, my scan looked good. And I didn't really know enough at that point to, to say, wait a minute, how can it possibly be good when there's all that radiation in my arm and not in my bloodstream? So as I learned more about extravasation and I started asking my institution whether I can be monitored and just tremendous resistance to this, that we have very few extravasations, that that's not an issue. And at one point, the head of radiology actually said to me that um, they do a fine job in any way these scans are not really, you know, um, predicting or we're not basing your treatment on these scans. And I was so, um, you know, I, I'm a pretty smart patient, you know, and by this time I've been living with metastatic breast can cancer for a long time. And uh, um, even, and I'm a pretty fierce advocate, but I even cowered when I was meeting with the head of radiology and he was talking to me about physics that I didn't even know to say, wait a minute, then why in the hell am I doing these every three months if my treatment is not being um, based on this? And so, you know, I've been active in advocacy. I've actually met with the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission twice now to try and get this um, monitoring or reporting um, to happen, and they keep resisting. And the important, I guess the most important thing to understand is extravasations are so easily solved. This is a problem that can be solved through monitoring and through the use of tools to find the right veins and to be able to tell if you've blown a vein. If you monitor these injections, you can see where there needs to be retraining of technology, right? In a study that was done in a hospital where all the, they were using um, a tool that they could monitor and the, and the monitoring kept all the data, they were able to tell that there was one technician who was left-handed, who just was tilting the needle incorrectly. Um, and unfortunately, that technician was the one who was training other people, their other technicians. So they did a retraining. It's a perfect opportunity for quality control and to keep providing information and training and using the ultrasound machine or other techniques. And if it was monitored and if it had to be reported, then I would be able to go online and see where I wanted to get these scans done. So it's critically, critically important, whether it's being extravasated or whether there are other issues that are causing a problem if your veins have become a web of veins after having all of these um, scans, et cetera. There are other reasons that could cause the nuclear medicine not to be in your vein at exactly the right amount and the right dosage. So it's really important for us to be our own advocates, which can be hard even if you are fierce in certain circumstances, because there's information that you, you want to hear that you're okay. You want to be your doctor's favorite patient and you don't want to be the pain. And um, many of us, I'm in a metastatic breast cancer support group, and many of us don't read our charts or, you know, just want to follow the doctor's um, advice. Well, um, I knew the story because you were on my show, but on my podcast, so I'll send that out. But I know that there's going to be questions and I'm so glad that you shared this because so many things that you shared are important about, we doubt ourselves as a patient when someone with authority comes in and says, no, there's no way. And you want that good news and which is what you've shared, but also when something happens to think other 
out of the box. So I'm glad, Carrie, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for you, Pam, letting her share that picture of what it looks like on the x-ray, because I think that's really important as well as to know. And um, I just, I, I'm sad about what happened, but I'm also fierce about why Her Health X is around is because of these kinds of conversations and we want to improve health outcomes and we can't if we continue to do things the same way. So thank you for sharing this and we'll come back to q and I'm sure the, there's people um, on, the, on the meeting today that are going to have questions for you and I'm going to go to Molly, but we will circle back with you for questions. So thank you so much, Pam, for sharing your story today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to um, come to Molly McDonald. Molly, um, thank you for being here today. I'm going to make a spotlight on you. Um, thank you so much for being here today. And um, I'll let you introduce yourself because there's uh, and and the work that you're doing at the Pink Fund because I think it's uh, amazing. So thank you for being here. Well, first I want to thank Pam. I a lot of questions I have about remedies for this. I know it's hard to stop. I was like, right, oh, I can't even really pronounce extravasation. I always pronounce it extravacation. I don't know. It, but anyway, thank you for sharing that. My other question for Pam offline a little bit is my concern over that archetype score and then the fact that you became metastatic, which tells us how sneaky breast cancer is, right? This is a disease that mutates. It, they kind of hide out um, like guerrilla warfare and roars back in at any time. So um, I was diagnosed with early stage disease in the spring of 2005. I was transitioning between jobs. I'd been through a financially devastating divorce, left to raise five children on my own. I recently remarried, but my income was critical um, to our family's welfare, and I carried the health insurance. So that diagnosis uh, resulted in the loss of my job opportunity, and um, I now had a COBRA premium of $1,300 a month to ensure my access to potentially life-saving care. And without my income, I was able to pay my health insurance premium, but I was not able to make my house payments. So my house fell into foreclosure and um, my vehicle was at risk for repossession. Every 58 days, Ford Credit would call and ask if I was planning to make a payment or should they plan to repossess my vehicle. And then I was threatened with utility shutoffs. And finally, um, at the end of treatment, when all the food stopped being delivered to the cooler on the porch. I was in line at a food bank for four months to feed my children. But what resulted in the founding of the organization that I had the privilege to lead um, was sitting in the treatment waiting rooms, radiation waiting rooms for six weeks, pretty much seeing some of the same people day in and day out and listening to their concerns about um, a side effect of cancer that in 2013, and I'm sure Pam knows um, Yusuf Safar and Amy Abernathy, because I saw that you were at Duke, um, termed financial toxicity, which is a term that impacts treatment adherence and affects quality of life. Um, and I certainly experienced it firsthand. And these women in the treatment waiting rooms were making life-altering decisions, the most egregious of which was, I, I can't lose my home. Um, I'm going to have to stop treatment and go back to work. And so I had that, what I call the Oprah aha moment, and went home to my newish husband, Tom, and said, we've got to do something about this, and why don't we start a nonprofit? So I had no really nonprofit experience. I'd been in a junior league as a young woman. Um, but I had a vision for this organization. And so we bootstrapped it together, um, and... We do one simple thing. We pay non-medical bills for household expenses, housing, transportation, utilities, and insurance directly to patients' creditors for 90 to 180 days. And we do have a program for metastatic patients when they're on the wait period when they've been approved for SSDI, but they're in a five-month mandatory wait period where they can show no working income. And so I don't know how people live without any working income or Social Security unless they have, you know, a nice hefty bank account. So... Um, really love the work that we get to do, um, the impact it has not only on the financial health of families, but their mental and emotional health. It improves their treatment adherence and uh, reduces medically related bankruptcies. And then, uh, of course, improves survivorship outcomes. So 
One of the things that Pam talked about was being your own best advocate. And um, patients are either like Pam, fierce and forceful, or they're afraid of their physicians. And so one of the things I did recently, I spoke at an ASCO direct meeting in Lansing, Michigan. Um, and I talked about patient communication styles. So I want to start with that. And then I will talk a little bit about step therapy, which is what we were initially going to talk about. But I think that this is more important, particularly having listened to what Pam talked about. So patients really need to understand their own communication style. Um, Natalie spoke earlier about the five love languages, but this, these are the, the four communication styles. And so if you're an analytically thinking patient, you want data. So you want to know, like Pam made her decisions based on data. Data wasn't right in her particular case, which is alarming to me, but she sounds to me from what I heard that she's an analytical thinker. So she wanted to know all the data that's out there, even with the um, nuclear medicine extra video. I can't say that word, it's terrible. Um, so they want to know that. Or they're intuitive, they're short, direct, and to the point. They're a big picture thinker. That's kind of how I am. I become more analytical in the work that I have to do now, that I do now and then, or functional, detail-oriented. They want a thorough overview of every single option for treatment. Or they're personal. Their feelings and emotions lead the way, and they make decisions based on those kind of emotional experiences. Unfortunately, in the clinic setting, the clinician, the patient, the physician, or whoever the patient is seeing only has, you know, seven to 15 minutes to see a patient and doesn't really, I think, think about the communication styles for patients and how they want to be spoken to. So I don't know if you can pull up the next slide. Is it there, Natalie? Oh, there it is. So analytical, if you sense that your patient or your patient want analytical data, what's the clinical trial data or the other current research to explain your treatment recommendations? And patients are gonna to go to Google all the time. And those who are analytical are gonna come in armed with maybe, I have a friend who's had breast cancer in Florida and she's definitely analytical and she goes in with spreadsheets. I mean, I feel sorry for her doctors because she goes in and she wants to know every possible outcome and study. Um, if you're intuitive, those treatment goals, like what is obviously the goal is to live, but um, they may prefer one strong recommendation over several options. That can be a real problem for patients if you give them too many choices. So that is a challenge. And when we talk about shared decision-making, I believe having the data and understanding what you want out of life is important to lead to, a, based on the treatment option options to lead to the decision that you're going to make about your treatment. Then there's functional. Um, they want the date on timeframes and benchmarks. And I really love that idea. I love, like when I spoke with my doctor, I wanted to know, okay, when am I going to start treatment? When am I going to end? I'm kind of a planner. I like to have a calendar. I want to know exactly what's happening. No surprises. I'm not a fan of surprises. Um, and then personal, I, I kind of fall into all of these personally. Um, I'll go in and share details about my life or routines, hobbies, family, whatever. So when I experienced financial toxicity, it was because I didn't really share anything and nobody ever asked me, did I have any financial concerns about being able to complete my treatment protocol? So just recently, um, we at the Pink Fund completed a study with Northwestern Medicine in Chicago where 738 of um, people that we had helped opted in to be talk about financial toxicity. And some of the things we learned were pretty shocking. 58% um, of patients reported that nobody ever asked them, did they have any concerns about their ability to complete their treatment protocol as prescribed? or work through treatment. 83% indicated that they wanted to be asked. And the craziest part to me on all of that was that the assumptions made in the clinic setting around how a person physically presented by the color of their skin, how they were dressed, how they spoke, um, white women were not asked. 
about financial concerns for Black and Hispanic women were. So again, we're seeing a lot of um, discrimination and assumptions made in the clinical setting that affects treatment outcomes. So that study is available and I can send it out to anybody who requests it. Um, it was published in September. Then four years ago or three years ago, we did a study um, with the University of Michigan and Emory University where patients identified four gaps in the clinic setting and incorrect expectations about financial toxicity. So they talked about objective concerns, the things about their medical costs, and then the more subjective, um, am I going to be able to work? Am I going to be able to make my house payment? How am I going to feel through treatment? Um, but this study, particularly the gaps identified, there were four incorrect expectations about how treatment would affect finances. And what patients wanted was clarity as possible to discuss the expected costs in the timeline of treatment. What they asked for was to explore ways to manage cancer treatment expectations through decision aids or recruitment for allied health professionals to better prepare patients. The study that we did at Northwestern, patients indicated that they wanted to be asked at the time of the treatment protocol and they wanted to be asked along the treatment plan. So every month that they went in, they wanted to be asked, are they experiencing any financial concerns? Now we do know that some patients, um, unlike Pam and myself, you know, are reticent to express concerns about cost of care or their inability to work and complete their treatment protocol because they're afraid that they'll be offered not the best treatment. Um, I don't know if you've experienced that, Pam, but we've had a number of people anecdotally tell us that very scenario when they've expressed to a pay, to a physician actually here in Detroit at a NCI cancer center um, that this individual was afraid she wasn't going to be able to work and the doctor's response was, well, we'll give you a lower dose. So a lower dose can possibly lead to not the optimal outcome. Then the second gap identified that the Northwestern study proved again was lack of provider conversations about finances. And again, that finances should be discussed early and ongoing. And what the patients wanted to have them um, ask about was to investigate ways to optimize provider conversations and identify value concordant ways to better inform patients of financial implications of treatment at the optimal time. Well, the optimal time in the second study was at the time the treatment was prescribed and all along the treatment protocol. Um, there are two organizations nationally that providers can purchase a software program. One is Atlas Health and the other one is TaylorMed. And those go in and the patient is screened at the time of the treatment protocol. It reviews your insurance plan, what it will or will not cover, and it predicts fairly accurately um, what other outcomes you might have financially. So. If you're unable to work, how much time based on your income and your job are you gonna lose um, in, in a paycheck? Or is your treatment protocol gonna outlast your FMLA benefit? Or do you even have a federal medical leave act benefit which can affect treatment protocols? And then the other, uh, the third gap was there's just an inability to identify financial resources. And we know this is true. We're one of many organizations that provide financial assistance um, Across the United States, there are small ones that will do small amounts of, you know, maybe send a, a gift card for groceries or they'll deposit. I know that Coleman has a financial assistance program that is not always available. They have open and closed funding, but they'll put um, an amount of money directly in a patient's bank account. Cancer Care is another one that can provide financial support and Living Beyond Breast Cancer opens up a program about every other month. But the challenge for patients is they're going down multiple, multiple rabbit holes. So it really is a mess trying to sort that all out. And just the last identified gap was lack of support in navigating the healthcare system. So what we know is that financial navigators who are trained to understand the insurance that the patient carries um, and know of local and national resources really help to mitigate the financial toxicity that patients experience. And it's also, it doesn't just affect the patient, it affects the family and the caregiver. So um, those studies are available. And again, going back to how patient communication styles, they kind of work together.
Yeah, we've got some questions in the chat about um, the some of the, the the things that you mentioned, and if it if we can also send it out post. Um, oh, if, yeah. If you can pop in there the names of it, but if not, yeah. I'll send it out in a post. And also, um, uh, your volume, if you can um, move it up a little bit, that would be great because they're That's bad. Great. Can you hear me better now? I can hear you, but some of our some of our um, participants weren't able. to. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, thank you. No, no, no. It's okay. I, you. Um, anyway, we're gonna keep going. <laughs> so, so we have a few minutes left for questions. Molly, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I will circle back with you on um, on some of the things that you were sharing, so that I can make sure we'll we'll have the links. Um, and oh, you sent this to me direct. Okay, I will. Um, I will follow up and send to you all. Um, post event, the resources that we talked about today. It's so important. So don't worry about that. We will have it out and I promise I will send it um, uh, to you all. So I want to open it up, um, see if I'm going to remove the spotlight off of you. So that way um, we'll just open it up and see if anyone has a question, if you want to put it in the chat. And I know some of you were asking questions about <laughs> what we were just talking about, but um, share either in the chat or if you want to come off off microphone and ask a question of our of our panel about any of the topics that we've been talking about. We've covered a lot in a short amount of time, and I'm so grateful to each of you for giving such robust dimension to um, how complex it is cancer care is for women. So, anyone have a question? I'm going to look at um, you. Have a question? <laughs> well, I want to know what happened to Pam when this spot showed up on the ultrasound. Yes. How do you remedy that? You've got this nuclear medicine floating around in your body that can cause damage to tissue. What is, what is the antidote to that? Yeah, there. I mean, it, what should have happened, which didn't, is uh, warm compresses and massage to try to get it um, through. That Nobody told me to do that. Um, you know, I was sort of um, kind of ignorant about all of that. So I didn't do any of that. And to this day, and that was a couple of years ago, to this day, sometimes that area really aches. And I always wonder if that's um, because of the extravasation. We no longer use that vein, uh, that particular vein, there's scar tissue there. And, but you know, even that you have to be fierce with because it feels good to the touch. So the technician touches that. Oh, I found, and I have to say, no, that vein is not usable. There's scar tissue there. Um, and many times I'll say this, here's a good vein and they just, but now because I didn't have, I don't want to it's take too long with this. I didn't have another extravasation, but I did have another problem where the um, juice, as I call it, didn't go through the system because it was caught up in a series of veins that had become a web. And so from that point on, I can, worked with the head of radiology. And now in my chart, in all caps, it says this patient must have um, an ultrasound for um, IV access. And really, it should be the protocol at every single institution. If you have metastatic disease and you are getting scanned every three months, um, even if you aren't really, but if they're only going to do one small thing, there should be a protocol that an IV ultrasound tool is used if you are using nuclear medicine in a scan. You know, I have CT scans, bone scans um, every three months. I used to have PET scans every three months, but Medicare quit paying for those, which is another whole topic. But, you know, the CT scan is not nuclear medicine. So I'm not quite, it's just contrast. I'm not quite as um, worried about that. But the, if somebody is getting a nuclear medicine scan, either a PET scan or a bone scan, they should be required to use the ultrasound, the IV ultrasound, or some technique to be able to see whether they've hit the vein, they're in the vein, and they haven't blown it, or they haven't come at, punctured the vein. So, Carrie, my question is, why are the radiologists resistant to this? And is the radiology lobby lobbying against this bill? 
Yeah, it's a really great, great question. And I certainly don't want to put our professional medical societies, you know, on the hot seat, um, because there are so, so many great things that they do for patients. But this is a really um, controversial subject. And I think part of it is because it's being regulated by a regulatory body that's not in healthcare, right? They're, they're regulating our nuclear reactors, and now we're asking them to make decisions on healthcare, which really um, isn't their purview, right? The Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So um, I also, I like to make this metaphor and the New York Times just did a great opinion piece about sort of um, professional societies and how they double down, even if the evidence and, and, you know, suggestions from other members are in contrary to their guidelines, they sort of double down. And New York Times just did a great opinion piece about peanut allergies and where the oh. American Academy of Pediatrics was like double down on it. And now like 30 years later, they're like, oh, we were wrong. So I have a feeling that the professional societies that are doubling down against the reporting of extravasations in 30 years, we're going to have a New York Times opinion piece where they they were wrong. And so I think part of it has to do with fear of liability, right, uh, being sued, that type of stuff um, would be would be my guess on why they're so against it. But it's also kind of what professional societies do. They look out for them and their members. And it would be a lot like, you know, um, airlines. Uh, being, uh, you know, in charge of their own regulations instead of having having a, you know, um, uh, a government entity sort of make sure that that people who travel on airplanes are safe. So that's what it's similar to. And and that's really why we have to advocate for ourselves. And I know there's a question in the chat. So the bill number is HR. So it's only been introduced in the House of Representatives. So it's HR 6815 called the Nuclear Medicine Clarification Act. Um, there's also a question about how to get involved. Go to our website, safernuclearmedicine.org. There's infographics to tell you more about the um, legislation. And then it sends an email to me and I can tell you how to get involved. I can let you know how to email your representative to become a co-sponsor and get you more involved. So just going to our website, safernuclearmedicine.org, will get you all um, the information that you need. And I just wanna remind everyone that years ago, it was women, breast cancer survivors, and who advocated, and it took years to get it required that mammography machines be calibrated on a regular basis because there was, we learned that mammography machines, the more it's used, they get off center or what I, you know, I'm not a scientist or a technician there. And it took women, fierce women, years to get that law uh, introduced and passed. And now every mammography machine must be calibrated. And, you know, we just had a situation in North Carolina where um, a radiology uh, organization did mammographies and a month later or so found that their machine was not calibrated correctly and people had to come back in to get mammograms again. So, you know, societies don't like to be regulated, period. And um, it's not that they're opposed to patient safety. It's that they think they are doing the right thing and that they're doing a great job and they do not want to be regulated. I think some of it may be also that the technician that makes the mistake doesn't want to get in trouble. Well, of course. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. yeah. And doesn't know, oftentimes a technician, like Pam's technician, didn't even know she was extravasated. So let's train them better. Let's give them the right. tools they knew, need to do the best job possible. And I agree with Pam. No one is doing this maliciously, but yeah. it takes patience to do the right thing, right? So that's what we need to do. We need to make change. And the only way to do that is through patience. Yes, absolutely. It has been such an amazing experience having all of you here today. Thank you for sharing your story, Pam. Thank you, Carrie, for telling us all about extravasation and Molly for sharing your story. 
um, about, you know, how you started the pink fund, I will send out information. And also I popped into the chat, uh, her health X, we are a nonprofit as well, and always looking for volunteers, partners, and people to collaborate with in solving things like this. Our, our vision is to reduce mortality, morbidity for women in the next 10 years. And together we can do that. So thank you all so much for being here today. It's been great to have you. And we will send out all the information afterwards. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.